Breakdown, and this is The Breakdown. Hey everybody! Day it is. Guess what day it is? It's Wednesday. <laughs> and as you know, this is the breakdown. I am Catherine, aka the High Heels Gamer. And today I am joined by author, artist, Richard Bear Gray. Hello, Richard. Hello. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. As I mentioned, it's my 70th day in my KFC pajamas, so I'm great. Are you trying to break like a world record? Well, I mean, I'm just trying to see how long they last before they fall apart because they were a dollar. <laughs> that, that's dedication right there. Trying to see. Do you have any holes in it yet? No, I do. I like. So I have um, a, a very minor medical condition, uh, possibly because of all the caffeine drinks I have, but I'm, my pH balance is a little bit off. So I do wear through, um, clothes a little faster. And so these ones are actually standing up pretty well. I've in the past, maybe five years, I've never had to wash a pair of pants because they've always worn through before they needed cleaning. Oh, nice. But like, you know, like most normal adults, I don't clean pants more than once a month. So <laughs> It was awful. I was in just right right before the lockdown all started. I was in Target stocking up on things and I crouched down to get something. And as I did, like a family kind of stopped behind me to look at things on the shelf. And I realized that I was like one ball hanging out from my pants because a hole had just appeared when I went to get wine. And I was like, I don't know how to leave here. <laughs> and so I just kind of crab walk sideways. Hi, I'm here to make a good impression. <laughs> that's amazing. One ball out. I mean, I think that's how we should live life. One ball out. Just throw it to the wind. <laughs> now, Richard, you have worked on what feels like a gazillion projects. Um, everything from Blastosaurus. Am I saying that right? Yes. yes. Okay. Sure. To your latest, which is uh, Black Sand Beach. Um, this one right here. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about Black Sand Beach. Um, so I spent um, all my summers as a kid. I'm, I'm not going to put things down on a piano. That's a stupid place to put them. That was a note. Um, I spent all my summers growing up at a, uh, my family had like a, I, I want to really stress when I say a summer home, what I mean is a kit set house on poles that my dad and my aunt had built together very badly. And it would shake every year when there was a cattle stampede that went under us. But about eight miles along the beach, there was a haunted lighthouse. Uh, it was the oldest lighthouse in New Zealand. It had never worked very well. And so I used to be obsessed with this place and try and go there as often as I could and just hang out in this lighthouse to try and meet ghosts. And so um, a couple of years ago, I was uh, in a room being asked to pitch stuff by a super mysterious company. And um, I pretended like I'd been working on a book about this for years and sold them this graphic novel series. So it's about a kid sort of based on me named Dash and his best friend, Lily, and Dash's two cousins, Andy and Eleanor, um, at Black Sand Beach, which is a beach on the very edge of the world. So uh, on old maps, it would say, you know, Finisterre, here there'd be dragons, edge of the world sort of stuff. This is actually that place. And the darkness from another reality is bleeding through and just making everything super messed up and weird. And so lots of spooky stuff happens. Okay. Um, and I also know that you started a podcast recently, kind of um, giving like a little insight um, yeah, so um, we decided that we should uh, try and do something. The, the book was meant to come out May 5th, and then um, I was meant to be on a tour, and I was meant to, like, do big, exciting things, and we were in free comic book day for the second year in a row, and this year it was we had a Blastosaurus and a Black Sand Beach story, and then everything went away. And um, I live uh, – there's a recording studio in the, in the back half of my house, um, and my roommate's a musician and composer. And so we decided, let's just make something to help promote the book. Okay. Um, and without telling the publisher or going through anything official, we just 
started putting together um, uh, this this show. And it's the premise is that I, as a mess of a human, um, wake up after like a, a, a chicken wing fueled bender um, outside this lighthouse and there's nothing on me except everything I own in the entire world and a box of dictaphone tapes. And each tape is from this journalist who had been like detailing the, the, the weirdness at black sand beach. And so it's, you get a little introduction from me and then like a four or five minute spooky story from a very incompetent journalist who is basically his only source is he talks to a waitress who he never remembers meeting before. <laughs> um, so you kind of describe it in the, the little um, description area on the side as Lemony Snicket's and Twin Peaks. Like if anybody loves both of those things, that's the combo for this. That is a real, I actually, that's definitely one of my publicists to have written because I've never, oh. that's brilliant. That's yeah. Good. Yeah, in the description it says, if you love Lemony Snickets and Twin Peaks, this is the podcast for you. And as I'm listening, I do definitely get um, Lemony Snickets vibes because the narration sounds like the narration of um, Lemony Snickets. Not exactly the same, but, you know, close enough to where you're like, oh, I can definitely see that. So is this a weekly podcast that you're just trying to do? Yeah, so um, we did uh, a first season just to see if we could. I'm obviously like I'm relying on other like voice actors and things, so a lot of it has been based on availability. But we decided uh, we actually made the entire first season before we put it out. Um, so it was six episodes, and then uh, an announcement's coming soon. But I I don't think I'm allowed to say anything yet. But words like book might be associated with this podcast soon, uh, for instance. Um, and I need to have I need to have thirteen. Uh, if 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 it were a book, for instance, I might have to have thirteen short stories written for it by I don't know Friday. We'll see how that <laughs> now, did this podcast come about from like the whole quarantine? You know, you you were like, all right, what what can I do? Or had you already had this like in mind, like in side pocket? Um, I've been wanting to do something uh, outside of comics for a little while. Um, I have. I think Black Sand Beach is my 275th published book. Um, so I, every now and again, I get a little restless and I think, what could I do? And then um, I love horror stories. And I love doing stuff that just kind of ties in to build a bigger world. So the podcast, you don't have to have read the book to listen to the podcast. You don't have to listen to the podcast to read the book. It's just set in the same place. And it's because I'm fascinated by the idea of a million creepy things happening all around you and you never noticing them. Um, so it's, yeah, I, I think it kind of came from that. And then a, a friend of mine had been looking for something new to do and we've been looking to work together on something. So I was like, why don't we just, you know, he's good at podcasting and I have access to a million microphones. Um, <laughs> so I just thought I might as well, uh, let's just do this. And then because of the lockdown, I was like, this is something we can all do remotely um, and still make it like work super well. And I, I we'd already made a, um, a theme song for the book that we were using for a trailer um, that was meant to play before I came on to do any talks or anything on this tour that I'm not going on. Um, <laughs> so like we had all of these little pieces that we could use and I was like, we might as well put them into something. So that's where we're at. Where did your love for comic books come from? Was that an early age thing? It, I mean, it came from a love of money. Oh. Um, it came from a, a deep and abiding love of money. When I was, um, I'm going to get a little nostalgic. Um, when I was three years old, there was this, so I grew up in New Zealand uh, for the first like 30 years of my life. I lived in New Zealand and there was a store called the toy warehouse and it was the cheapest place you could buy toys. And it was huge. And uh, it was like all cement floors and high ceilings with ch shitty lighting. But the coolest part about it was that you could park on the roof of the building and to three year old me, that was like the most magical thing in the whole wide world. And, you parked on the roof and then there was like a little shack with a wooden door that was never quite fully closed. And you went in through that down some metal stairs, a like spiral metal staircase. And then you had to walk this catwalk over the entire store. Oh, wow. To go down. And I remember like the first time I did that, um, we look, we were looking like I stopped and looked over the edge and I was just looking at this like sea of very happy people. 
buying very affordable things that were all very deliberately designed to make people happy. Now, whether they were succeeding or not, I don't know. But as a three-year-old, I was like, everyone loves toys. What a perfect place. And I was like, I want to make um, well-designed deliberate objects that cause the same sense of happiness that I feel when I buy a Ninja Turtle. Um, and then I didn't know comics existed. I thought they were like a thing from the distant past. Um, you know, like TV exists now, so why do we need comic wow. books? And I, in New Zealand, there were four comic stores in the entire country. So I'd never seen a comic in person. I just thought they were like a thing from the past. And I knew what they were and how they functioned because like Michelangelo reads comics and you'd see like pictures of comic books. So when I was seven, I thought if I can make a comic book, I'll probably make millions of dollars because <laughs> I'll probably be the only person in the entire world doing it. And so I made this book uh, called Ghost Ghost about a ghost who struggles with like invisibility and loneliness. And uh, I was blackmailing my school librarian. I had her photocopy everything for me for free. And I started selling it at a school athletics day where I was for obvious reasons, not taking part. <laughs> and, um, and like I think parents just felt sorry for me, me, but I walked away with like 400 bucks. Oh, wow. I'm seven years old and I have 400 bucks. I can probably buy a million houses. And you know, <laughs> the, the realities and dangers of capitalism hadn't become apparent to me because blank check wasn't even gonna come out for two more years. Wow. A terrible joke, I'm proud I made it. No, no, it's great. Um, so after that, you were just like, oh, this is easy. Yeah. Walk, cake, cake walk, cake walk, that's the expression. <laughs> yeah, and I had three more years of free photocopying, and so I just started making book after book after book, and none of them were memorable or good. They were just quick to do. Um, I Then I started doing this, like, epic long-form thing about a guy who – he was just a man who was bald and someone had called him bald man. And so he thought he might be a superhero, but he wasn't. It was just all kid logic stuff. Um, and I ended up working on that and not selling any books for like four years. Um, and, and then I ended up, I sort of moved out of comics and started doing stand up comedy and then started doing the comic stuff again, um, in my spare time. And then, uh, it just, it just kind of kept building and building. Um, and by the time I finished college, I was, um, I'm not gonna say making millions of dollars, <laughs> but I was, I was doing like 15 conventions a year. And you know, when you're a college student and you can be like, hey, I've got $11, guess I'm gonna eat pizza for the next six months. Yeah. And just somehow it magically works. Um, I was living that life from, just from doing comics. And I thought, well, I guess I can't do this ever again. So I became a grown up and I got a job as a teacher and then did that for a week and a half. And then <laughs> my books got found by a guy on the set of, um, uh, I, can't, I can never remember the name of the film. It was the, the Jeffrey Rush film about the uh, Chinese guy who'd escaped to work as in a laundromat in the old West. And there are ninjas after him, I think. Um, I don't think it's good. Um, but it was being shot in New Zealand. This guy found the, the one of my books on the set. And then the uh, first Wolverine movie was being shot there the week later. They started, and he ended up working on that. And so then he contacted me. We had this long, messy internet <laughs> romance. Um, <laughs> that in the middle of all of it, I moved to Australia to live with him while he was working on Wolverine and then met people through the, was working as his assistant as well so that we could, you know, play Scrabble and make out. Um, and then I met people on set and then one of them optioned one of my ideas to be turned into a big series and potentially a bunch of other stuff, which of course all went wrong, but I was 23. So I was like, I guess nothing can ever go wrong. <laughs> Cut to two years later, I am in a hotel room with a with a WWE wrestler who uh, has, for some reason, stolen the Starro uh, starfish from my toy that I bought at Comic Con that day, and like then being sort of abandoned and not knowing how to get anywhere, and uh, losing my glasses, and joining the line for Hall H at 4 a.m. because I was stumbling home from a party, and then Derek Robertson seeing me and rescuing me, being like, "Richard, this is not a good look for anyone. What is wrong with your life?" And like just walking me back to a different 
route out saying just sit down and wait for your plane. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You're living like the adventurous life. Well, a lot of people don't realize how, how trashy comic books really are. Yeah, the awesome meter. Yeah, like you're hanging out with WWE stars. Like, he, Well, the interesting thing was I never found out the guy's name. All I knew was that he was a wrestler. And, you know, looking at him, that was definitely true. Um, and uh, I came in late on one because I, I wasn't meant to be sharing a room with him. And then, you know how Comic-Con is, you end up sharing rooms. And yep. he ended up being sort of homeless and got put in my room. And I came in late one night. The TV was on playing uh, playing Troy. And I turned it off. And this and I didn't even know anyone else was in there. And this wrestler sits up and goes, I need that to sleep. <laughs> like, Ooh. Put that back on. I played on loop all night long. Wow. Oh, talk about interesting roommates. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now you're in California. Yes. Um, what's that been like going from like New Zealand to Australia to California? It was, it's been great actually. Um, I, after, after everything went wrong at Comic-Con the first time I moved back to New Zealand, um, from, I, I, well, I moved back to New Zealand from Australia, but I then went to Comic-Con, came back to New Zealand and was like, I just need to, I need to escape this country because there's nothing to do here. And so I became really focused on just building and building and building like my brand in New Zealand and my comics in New Zealand. So that once I did leave, I would have like that firm base to at least, you know, springboard me somewhere. And after like seven years, maybe eight years of doing that, I was like, I was at a convention and my booth was, 60 feet wide and 20 feet deep and I had a staff of 10 and I had 200 books with my name on them and we had a, a we had two uh, iPhone games one for Blastosaurus where he had to wait in line at a bank to deposit a check but bank <laughs> robbers were coming in and he'd lose his place in line when he went to punch them and <laughs> one where a ghost ghost had to float through a retirement home scaring old people to death so we'd have more friends um, and we had an action figure and we had an animated web series and I looked around, oh, yeah. there's nothing else I could do. And I realized it wasn't that I'd been building things up. It's that I'd been like sheltering myself by keeping busy and just jumping up and down on the spot. Um, and so I took all my worldly possessions into the convention with me and was like, every book gets a free thing I own and oh, wow. every page of art is now a dollar. And uh, then I walked out and I had one big plastic tub of stuff left and it was my best friend Nigel who's a plastic skeleton that I stole um, and like six pairs of shoes some underwear some t-shirts and like thirty thousand dollars in cash and wow. I just got on a plane and came here. Wow. wow. And, no regrets. Um, <laughs> um, and now you're not only the writer you're also the artist correct? Yes I do all I do all the everything I do pencils inks colors letters everything. Yeah. I saw on your Instagram that you do um, a couple of videos of you doing your art um, or creating your art, not doing your art. Excuse me, sorry. <laughs> there's, there's no, no, I'm never, I'm never fancy about words. Like I do silly. My my grandmother once put it best when she said, "Richard, what are you gonna do for a living when you when you get tired of your silly little dragon books?" Oh. I was like, "I will agree that they are silly and little, but Blastosaurus is a dinosaur, not a dragon." <laughs> Um, but uh, Blastosaurus has actually gotten redone, correct? Or is it still the original print, the the one from um, Free Comic Book Day? So we, so what? It's it's like so many things. There have been so many iterations of Blasto at this point because there was the first version that got launched at Comic Con with horrible misprints. Um, by the the company was called American Original. They were an imprint of Talk Cow that never really eventuated. Um. And that version was like the one I hated that I didn't want to be a part of, but I was young and stupid. Um, so then I relaunched it for New Zealand with like, not exactly the way I wanted it to be, but just a, a far better version. I was working with another guy who was really focused on Blasto being serious and grown up because he was like, you know those people who, um, 
they read comics when they were young and then they got back into them because Alan Moore exists and then they don't understand that you can do fun things. They just have to be serious, you know? Um, and so he was like, Blasto has to be a cop. And I'm like, but cops suck. They work, work in a laundromat. Um, and, and just all that kind of, you know, that it was, it was good, but not exactly what I wanted it to be. And so then when I moved out here, uh, I was very jet lagged. It was my first day in the country. Um, all I really, all I remember from that day is waking up at a concert venue and not knowing what I'd seen. And then later finding videos on my phone from that night. And I'd gone to see a Tegan and Sarah show, um, which I wish I remembered. Um, <laughs> And then I thought my credit card had been stolen because someone had spent a bunch of money paying a phone bill. And so I canceled my credit card. And then it turned out that I'd just been nice and paid my friend's phone bill for him and didn't remember it. And so then my my mother was like, hey, Richard, I can like, I had to get a new credit. I didn't have a bank account in the US yet because it just arrived. So I had to get like my bank to send a credit card to my mom's house. Aww. And then I called her, I was like, let me know when you get it and send it to me. She's like, no, I already posted it. I'm like, but I have never given you my address. <laughs> He's like, oh, then I don't know where I sent it. Oh, wow, wow. So I, had, I was back to that pizza lifestyle because I had like, I had I had $30,000 in cash, but it was all New Zealand money. And um, I'd left it at another friend's house that I wasn't staying at because I didn't trust the place I was staying. <laughs> had that much cash on me. And so I had like $140 <laughs> and then a month until I got access to any money. Wow. <laughs> um, but on that first day, I went into, I wandered into Golden Apple because I needed a comic store to start buying books at. And apparently they had, we'd gotten talking and they'd said, oh, we're just starting a publishing line. Uh, do you do comics? I said, yes. I apparently showed them Blastosaurus. They offered me a publishing deal to reprint all of it. And I apparently said, no, that sounds really boring. Why don't I just restart the whole thing? I can have a first issue for you within a week. Oh, wow. And Three days later, I get an email being like, hey, Richard, can we see the script at least? And I was like, for what? What are you talking about? Who is this? I don't know what's happening. And they're like, we gave you we gave you a contract and like it was a loose term sheet, but you signed it. You should be making the book. I'm like, oh, no memory at all. But apparently I got a job on the first day. Um, wow. And so then I, uh, <laughs> and I ended up drawing this comic in the first issue was done in a, like a week and a half. Um, so I was a little late. Only time I've ever missed a deadline. And then, yeah, so it's like, so that now it's, it's, it's essentially a third version of Blastosaurus that exists and everything was going well. We got into free comic book day last year and it was a, it was like the one year anniversary of the first issue being released. So we did a, a whole thing where it was his one year dinoversary and everyone in town came, came out to like tell stories about how Blasto would save them. And so because I do, I like doggedly stick to a schedule of like, listen, Blastosaurus arrived three days ago. We're at issue seven, and he's been there a week and a half. We do not know any. Like I'm, I'm showing every minute of his adventures because it's like I'm obsessive like that. And so, jumping forward a year, I've been able to be like, cool. And here is a wet villains called the Swampires. They're vampires who live in a swamp. This guy is the crop duster. He's fart powered for some reason, and it's like I it was just wild. And then Blasto, we did a bunch of specials last year. We did um, this one here, the Blastosaurus Summer Special. Um, where they're in the woods camping and they discover that there's a factory growing mascots because it's cheaper to grow your own mascots than it is to pay residuals to actors. Um, and uh, we did a Halloween special and then we were in Halloween free comic day and then everything was just kind of building and then the ongoing series took a hiatus while they did Black Sand Beach and then we went back into production. Issue 7 came out and then the lockdown hit and issue 8 and 9 are, who knows? Um... They might come out, they might not, they might like, there's just, no one knows anything now. Um, and our free, we were in free comic book day again, but of course there's now like 47,000 copies of the Richard Fairbray monster showcase sitting in comic stores all over, you know, yeah. it's just like spawn issue one, except the stores haven't closed down. <laughs> um, it's a joke for the nineties distribution fans. <laughs> um, so, and right, yeah, pretty much. Uh, a lot of though, a lot of comic book stores are doing drive-by free comic book day, where you drive and pick up your bundle of goodies and then drive home to read it. So, yeah. But, <laughs> I mean, like, 
I hope that works. But here's the thing: when you you know when when you're when you're Spider Man, not when you're Spider, when you're the person who makes Spider Man, when when you're a big company, you have Spider Man, you have Batman, you have whoever else. People already know who that is. They wander up. They're like, "What free thing am I going to get? Am I going to take the thing I've never heard of, or am I going to take the thing that I know I already like?" And so, with, when they're presented with that, they'll always if they got to take one, they'll always take the thing they already know. If they're allowed to take three books, there's a much higher chance they're going to pick up the thing by me. Yeah. And especially when, like, if I'm in the store on the free comic book day or the weekend of or whatever. I mean, like last year, I was in four different stores on the Saturday, and then I did a big event on the Sunday. And I think, like, my there was one point where my hand just completely seized up because, like, this because I'd signed like four thousand copies of a book, wow. and. There's, there's, there's no, you know, there's no equivalency to that um, when, when it's drive by. Like, yeah. I can't go out of a comic store as people drive by. But you never know. It could be in there, and your colors are so vibrant, so eye catching. I'm sure people are gonna be like, "Ooh, what's yes. this?" Yes, I, I think, like, I think it's gonna be fine. I just, it's one of those. Um, uh, I really felt like, and I think a lot of people are feeling this. A lot of like people in, in creative industries are feeling like. How many people do you know who have been like, I was right on the cusp of something or like, this was the year that everything was coming together or yeah. like, you know, and it, it sort of felt like that um, a little bit, you know, with, with Black Sand Beach had been this insane thing where um, I had, uh, I, I pitched out of nowhere and I said like, hey, it's going to be three books, 64 pages each. And just as a loose idea, I didn't really know what it was going to be. I had no plan. And they came back with an offer for two books, but they met my page rate. So I was like, okay, that's disappointing, but sure. I didn't read the contract because I never have ever in my life read a contract. Um, and things keep going wrong for me. I don't know why. <laughs> and they, um, my editor came back to me and it was the, the due date was May 1st. And on January 6th, my editor calls and she's like, Hey Richard, are you sure you can actually uh, get this book done in time? It's quite big. I was like, no, it's fine. It's like the first books do in four months. It, I can I can normally draw at least two pages a day, so that's easy. And she's like, "It's not a sixty-four page book, Richard. We 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 commissioned you for two books, each containing three sixty-four page stories. You've got to do one hundred and ninety-two pages in four months." And I was like, "Well, okay, I'm going to go hang myself." Um, and so I just I moved into my office full time and I bulk ordered um, these adult premium body wipes. Um, so that I wouldn't have to shower, and I just just really hunkered down. It was it was a good time. Um, the wipes I got for it was twenty thousand of them for twenty dollars, and it turns out they weren't the best quality. And now I have some permanent chemical burns. Oh god! So, but still, best time of my life. <laughs> I can only imagine. <laughs> well, Richard, we're coming down to the wire here. Um, any new thing that you want to plug real quick? Um, no, I mean, I, I just say if, if you like horror and, you know, I, I grew up on things like um, R.L. Stein's, like The Babysitter and Halloween Night and stuff like that and Eerie Indiana. And if, if you're the kind of person who, who likes those spooky things and wishes there were more of them for kids, <laughs> please check out Black Sand Beach. I'm, it's, I'm unbelievably proud of it. I'm going to show a picture, which I think is the like coolest, creepiest thing I've ever come up with. Um, I created these creatures who are only ever referred to as definitely not cows. Um, there they are, my bipedal green horses with mouths in their stomach. They will definitely like sneak their way into your home as a beloved pet and then slowly replace one member of your family. Um, so check that out. Check out Tales from Black Sand Beach, the podcast. And please, like, I've, I've got... I'm signed on to do a couple of other ongoing series. Um, one's called Carbordia, which is more of a middle grade fantasy, and one's called Crinimals. It's about animals who do crime. Um, so just follow my Instagram. It's at Richard Fairgray Author, or I'm on Facebook as Richard Fairgray Children's Author. On Twitter as Blastosaurus, and you know. And your website as well. Yes, yes, RichardFairgray.com. Yes. And if, well, you're, Richard, if you're an adult who likes adult things, go to my other website, RichardSocks.com, where I do my memoir. Oh wow. I didn't know that. Well, Richard, I appreciate you taking the time and, and coming on the show. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm sorry if I waffled and, and ran oh, no, you were perfect. terrible life decisions. <laughs> no, it was perfect. You were awesome. Um, and I thank you so much for being here. Um, definitely go follow Richard. He's on this side right here. <laughs> go follow Richard. Go pick up a copy of Black Sand Beach. I read some of it and it was great. Um, as always, you know, we're the breakdown. I'm Catherine. Follow, man, at this point, if you haven't followed, what what are we doing with our lives, people? And you need to be following because, you know, episode 50 is coming soon. And there may be a really nice surprise for you guys. So follow, share, subscribe because there's a newsletter. Do it because you love me. Do it because you love to see me torture Jack with the things that I do. And as always, I'll see you guys next Wednesday. Bye, everyone.